Hi everybody, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my vegetable garden. So today is vegetable Q&A day. A few days ago, I posted on my Facebook page asking folks to let me know what kinds of vegetable garden questions they had. And boy, did I get a lot of responses. Now, I don't want this video to go on and on and on because that's boring and it'll take me forever to upload it. So I'm going to do my best to be short and to the point. Now what I've done for this video is I'm putting black slides with the name of the vegetable that I'm going to be answering questions for throughout the video and that way you can easily navigate through it. But the one thing I've found is if one person has a question about a certain vegetable gardening topic, there's probably 10 to 20 more of you who have the same question. So that way, I'm hoping I can get out a lot of information to many of you. I hope this is going to be really interesting and informative. So let's get started. So I'm sitting in the middle of our tomato patch because the very first questions I thought I should answer are about growing everybody's favorite vegetable. Well, technically it's a fruit, but that's the tomato. So Bill and Heidi had a similar question and I thought I'd lump those together. They say, we have had lots of rain and the tomato plants look big and amazing. I have flowers, but they don't seem to be setting fruit. Is it the fact that it's 90 degrees or is there something I can do to help them set fruit? Well, of course, here in Spokane, it has been the exact opposite. It has been cold and rainy like you wouldn't believe. And that will come into play for the next question. But anyway, to answer Bill and Heidi, the optimal temperature for tomatoes to set fruit is between 60 and 75 degrees. So I would definitely agree it's the heat that's causing the problem. And one thing you might consider do, doing to help them out is to use maybe a little shade cloth over them. But it's a real problem. When it's super hot, they just plain don't want to set fruit. And of course, the pollen gets really sticky in the heat, so it's very hard to pollinate even by hand other flowers. So Mary Jane says, my tomatoes look sad as all get out. Too much rain and not enough sun. Everything is looking sad. Well, Mary Jane, I'm not sure where you live, but if you're here in Spokane, I'm right there with you. <laughs> it has been so cold and so wet. And the problem is that, first of all, plants don't like a ton of water. And that's what's happening. You know, some of my tomato plants are looking a little droopy here. And you'd think, wow, they've gotten all this moisture. That's great. Well, actually, it's been a little bit too much. The other thing that's happening is that nitrogen is getting tied up in the soil and not being made available to the tomato plant's roots. And that's because it's been so chilly. So really, the soil needs to warm up. Now, we're fortunate because we have about a week of really good-looking weather in the forecast. And so I think everything is going to just grow by leaps and bounds. So I'm very excited about that. But it's not surprising to hear that your plants are looking a little sad. And it's been the problem of too much moisture combined with cooler temperatures and a lack of nitrogen. It's frustrating, but... There's nothing you can do. Okay, uh, Jaime or Jamie, I'm not sure which, um, should you pull the first fruits on your tomato plants? Now I have never done this. I just let plants start flowering when they want to start flowering and producing fruit. But if you bought some seedlings in a garden center, let's say, and they're tiny little things, and they're already putting some fruit on, I would pull those off and let the plants focus their energy on growth. And a lot of times what will happen is in garden centers, sometimes, I don't want to be critical, but sometimes they don't get regular watering and so the plants become stressed and it's in their genetics to say, oh, I need to produce seed because I'm probably going to die and I want to continue my progeny here. So um, it happens naturally. 
So anyway, um, what I would say is if your plants are really small, maybe they came from a garden center or nursery, I would go ahead and pull them off. But under normal circumstances, there's no reason to have to pull them off. Okay, Kim says, my three tomato plants, all purchased or donated, seem spindly. Definitely not thriving, no idea why. Two plants took over my raised bed last year, so I planted them in two new grow bags. Those are those cloth grow bags like what I have some of my potatoes growing in. Uh, with bag soil for raised beds, and they are not happy. Okay, well, Kim, I, I don't know where you live exactly, but if the plants were in their pots for a long time, or they got off to a rough start before you bought them, they will take a bit of time to get back on track. So you might consider giving them an organic fertilizer that's high in nitrogen, and that is the first number on the package. And that will promote some good leafy growth. So that would be something you could start out with just to see if that perks them up a little bit. Okay, Cheryl, how late can I plant tomatoes? I purchased several from Home Depot and they all have diseases, browning edges on all the leaves. I may need to pull them. I'm in zone 5B, and that's where I am, 5B, and she's in Indiana. And I guess I should uh, interject here just in case anybody is not familiar with me or my garden. I'm in Spokane, Washington. That's eastern Washington state. We have a short growing season, and again, we're in zone 5B, just, just to give you some uh, idea here. Anyway, um, so yeah, we're in the same hardiness zone, Cheryl. And if the leaves are brown just on the edges, I would say probably it was more a lack of water or irregular watering while they were at the store. And since you've already got the plants, I would just go ahead and get them in the ground and see how they do. I mean, what have you got to lose, right? And when I'm buying tomato plants, I guess I should say if I buy tomato plants, because I pretty much start everything from seed, I always look for varieties that are fairly short season that will uh, ripen the tomatoes within, say, 65, 70, 75, ooh, maybe 80 days. That's a little bit tough there, but um, it, it, from when you plant them in the garden. And so it is a good idea to buy something that's on a short growing season so that you will get ripe fruits before the end of your season. Okay, Pam says she uh, is a first time tomato grower and uh, she's also growing bell peppers, uh, both of them in a greenhouse. She says, I seem to be getting more aphids and spiders and so I am spraying for them, but it seems as though my pepper leaves are not taking it very well. I'm assuming she means the spray. Could it be the heat and or the humidity? So uh, Pam, if I understand correctly, you're saying the pepper leaves aren't tolerating that spray. And I don't know what kind of spray you're using, but certainly what will happen is if a plant is under stress from a lot of heat and a lot of humidity like it would be in a greenhouse, that makes it even more difficult for them to tolerate something like that on their leaves. And when you say you're referring to, uh, you're referring to spiders, do you mean spiders or spider mites? If it's spiders, I wanted to emphasize that those are actually a beneficial insect. <clears throat> and um, so you don't want to spray for them. Uh, if it's spider mites, um, yeah, they're pretty awful, to be honest. And I do hope you're using some type of an organic spray. Uh, but anyway, maybe if you want to send me another email and clarify a couple of these things, I might be able to answer your question a little bit more thoroughly. Okay, Jan says, I've been busy letting my tomatoes grow roots and have been pinching my flowers and early fruit off. Thoughts? The poor plants are drowning out there. Okay, now I know Jan. <laughs> she lives in Spokane too. And, you know, I totally understand how you're feeling, Jan, because this has just been nuts. I mean, this is probably one of our rainiest springs ever. And uh, some of the plants are doing amazingly well, and some are really drowning in all the water. But all you can do is to just 
leave them be and let them grow. And like I was saying earlier, you really don't need to pinch off the flowers or fruits unless the plants are really very small. So yeah, hang in there. The weather is looking very promising starting today. So hopefully we'll be okay and our plants will perk back up. Arthi says, no matter what variety of tomato I grow, the fruits are really small. The plants look healthy though. So I have a couple of thoughts on this. Uh, first of all, what is your soil like? Is it fertile? Do you add compost to the soil? You know, that's what I do each spring very early and in the fall. I don't have to work it into the soil because the nutrients filter down through the soil all by themselves. And are the plants being watered on a regular basis? But again, not too much water like what we've been getting. The other question I had is, are you fertilizing them? And if so, are you giving them a fertilizer that's high in nitrogen? So again, that's the first number on the package. And what nitrogen fertilizers do is they promote leafy green growth, sacrificing the blossoms and the fruit. So if your plants are looking great, I'm suspecting maybe they're getting a little too much nitrogen. And what you might need to do, and I will talk about fertilizers later, but what you might consider doing is just to balance out a nitrogen fertilizer, go ahead and give them what's sometimes called a tomato fertilizer. The middle number, which represents phosphorus, is what plants need for blooming and setting fruit. And again, I'll, I'll talk about fertilizers in a bit because in theory, you shouldn't need to use much of any fertilizers at all. But if your plants are looking really, really robust, that means they've gotten a lot of nitrogen, but they need that phosphorus in order to bloom and set fruit. So I hope these things are helpful. Okay, we're coming along here. All right, so now we're gonna move into eggplants. And Elizabeth says, last season I planted eggplants in raised beds in full sun and got no fruit. There were plenty of flowers on the two plants I had. They were both the same variety, which was Black Beauty. And my garden was full of pollinators. What could have been the problem? I planted three varieties of eggplant this season, so I'm hoping to fix whatever the problem was from last year. And she says she's in Seattle, zone 8B. I'm so envious of people in zone 8. <laughs> okay, it sounds like you have done the right things. And again, uh, just like with the previous email, uh, my only question would be if you're using a nitrogen fertilizer with that high first number, and that promotes the leafy green growth rather than blooming and setting fruit. So it sounds like maybe you might want to go ahead and give them some type of, again, it could be what they call a tomato fertilizer. I always use organic fertilizers and uh, one that has a higher middle number, which is for phosphorus. And so I'm hoping that might maybe stack the deck in your favor this year. My next question is about growing peppers. So here I am in the hoop house with Bill's peppers. You'll recall that he is the pepper grower in the family and does an awesome job. So Carol says she lives in Taunton, Massachusetts. My pepper plants look good, but not many flowers. Should I be feeding them? Okay, you probably already know what the answer to this question is. You really shouldn't need to feed them especially very often. But again, my question is, what type of fertilizer are you using? Other than that, it's still fairly early in the growing season, so perhaps they will begin flowering more frequently soon. The plants do need sunshine and warmth in order to grow and produce peppers. And in looking at Bill's pepper plants, they are blooming, but not like crazy. So it probably is just a little too early in the season. 
Now my next two questions are about growing spinach and since I only grow it during the fall and winter months you're looking at a bed of Swiss chard which is very similar to spinach and actually very heat tolerant. So Rita says what's the secret for growing spinach? My crop grew about two inches then died out. Boy that is a really tough one to diagnose Rita. I don't know where you live or when you planted it but most spinach does not tolerate hot weather. So were the plants already dried out? Did they go to seed? Um, there are some spinach varieties that are a bit more tolerant of heat such as Matador and Bloomsdale Long Standing. So that is an idea. Now Debbie wants to know, do you deadhead spinach flowers to keep the leaves coming all summer? Mine are already sprouting seeds in Hayden and that is in North Idaho. Well Debbie, spinach is a cool season crop. As I mentioned earlier for Rita, it does not tolerate hot weather. So it's really a challenge and actually kind of an exercise in futility trying to get it to keep growing once the hot weather hits. So you are probably dealing with it bolting to seed because of the occasionally hot day that we've had. You could try some of the more heat tolerant varieties that I just mentioned. Also you might consider growing Swiss chard in place of spinach because it is much more heat tolerant. And that is what you're looking at again. We use it just like spinach. We freeze it. We use it in soups and casseroles and stews and all kinds of things and it is so heat tolerant so it's totally worth it. Now I have just a little aside here. If you're hearing a lot of beeping and background noise, I apologize. Our neighbors across the way are having a driveway poured and I'm, this is the only day I can do the video. So I'm just making do and trying to not record when all of the noise is happening, but it's going to be a challenge this morning. So Chris has a question about growing beets and that's what you're looking at there. They're looking a little sad because they've been under a floating row cover for all of their lives, but even so it gives you a little background there. So Chris says she's in Montana in zone three. Okay, so I'm not envious of that zone. <laughs> I'm really trying to grow beets and would love any and all advice that you can give. I've started my beets from seed and I'm going to transplant them into a big pot or container. Advice is always welcome and appreciated. I'm a first time gardener. Well, way to go, Chris, for gardening for the first time. You are absolutely going to get hooked. So I'm excited for you. Now, ordinarily, I wouldn't recommend transplanting beets because I'd always heard that root crops don't like to be transplanted. But I know of many folks who do it successfully, so, so much for that suggestion. But if you are using potting soil in your container, I would add a little bit of bone meal. So that is an organic amendment. It is high in phosphorus. That's the middle number on all packages of fertilizers and other amendments. And it promotes good root development. And certainly that's what you want for beets. The soil should stay lightly moist, but not sopping wet. No plant likes to have their roots standing in water and be sure to plant them about three inches apart so they have enough room to develop a nice root. You are going to love your homegrown beets. This next question is about growing beans and so I thought you might like to see how our pole beans are doing climbing up our little arbor setup. So Viola says, I planted Seychelles pole beans 18 seeds, only two came up. Why did the rest not? How can I get them to grow? New seeds. And she lives in Nebraska in zone five. Well, that's frustrating. Beans do need warm soil in order to germinate. So I'm wondering if maybe it was still too cold there when you planted them. I have two suggestions. First, try pre-sprouting the seeds by wrapping them in a moistened paper towel and then placing it inside a plastic bag for a few days. 
check on them a couple of times and once they've sprouted go ahead and plant them making sure that the root is pointing down. My other suggestion is if you'd rather just sow them directly in the garden try orienting the seeds so the scar or belly button as I like to call it is pointing down and that's where the inside of the curve is on the bean you'll see like a little scar there so point that down I've had good luck doing this because it orients the seeds in the correct direction for sprouting the thing with seeds is that it takes energy to sprout and they need to send a root down and a sprout up and so if something that's a large seed like a bean that's irregularly shaped is pointing in the wrong direction what happens is the seed uses up its energy in order to send that root down and the sprout up so that might help you know it's not necessarily a perfect solution but it's certainly worth a try this next question is about growing carrots so here's my little carrot patch so Heather says, we live in Walla Walla, and if you're wondering where that is, it's in Washington State, southwest of Spokane. She says, we planted carrots by seed this spring, and before I knew it, they all bolted. And that means bolting to seed. They're going to seed, signaling the end of their season. Any idea why? I grew three different types. Last year, I had a couple of my purple carrots bolt. I pulled the carrots and they are still very small and I think she's referring to this year's carrots. Well Heather, that is really odd. If you've had some hot weather that can cause the carrots to bolt to seed. However, the opposite can happen too. If the weather has stayed cool for longer than usual and we've certainly had a weird spring, that can make the carrots think they've been through the season, that fall is coming and they need to set seed. So I'm hoping your carrots will grow better this year. It's certainly important to water them regularly. That could also be a factor in stressing the carrots and making them bolt to seed. So anyway, I do hope that you have much better success this year. I'm hoping that's just a fluke. <laughs> These next two questions are about growing artichokes and since one of our artichoke plants is in a rather odd spot, it's a little hard to film, but I'm doing the best I can. So Cynthia says, artichokes, what do they need, when to harvest them, and maybe overwintering them in zone eight? And Nicole says, also wondering about artichokes, but I'm here in Spokane. It is my first time growing them. Okay, Cynthia and Nicole, artichokes need plenty of sunlight, at least six hours of sun a day and plenty of room. I would plant them about two and a half to three feet apart. They're very low maintenance. Harvest each artichoke when the heads are about the size that you would expect for that variety. You can find that information on the seed packet if that's what you started with. And while the scales are still tightly closed. I have only successfully overwintered them once in my zone 5b garden but all I did was trim them back a bit and cover them with some mulch as a bit of insulation. But they're really quite easy to grow and I think it's very cool that you're growing them. The next question is about growing squash. So here is my pumpkin bed. You can see the vines are really doing great. They don't seem to mind all of this moisture. Jaime asks, any suggestions for squash vine borers and striped cucumber beetles? The plants are already flowering and already have the beetles, I'm assuming the cucumber beetles, but still no sign of borers. Boy, both of those insects are really tough to control. We are so lucky that we don't get them here in Spokane, not that I want to brag or anything. Here are some suggestions for the cucumber beetles. Make sure you practice crop rotation every year. That means moving around families of crops into different areas of your garden, at least on a three-year rotation. And members of the cucurbit family are cucumbers, melons, squash, and pumpkins. 
So you want to do that because you need to make it hard for them to find your plants. Mulch heavily so that the beetles can't lay eggs in the soil around the base of your plants. And put boards underneath the developing cucumbers so they're not lying on the soil. Don't make it easy for those cucumber beetles. And certainly hand pick any beetles that you can find. For the squash vine borers, practice crop rotation again. Watch for moths flying around the plants and set out a yellow pail or container filled with water. And that's because they are attracted to the color yellow. They'll go to it, fall in, and drown. Use floating row cover if the plants are still small to keep the moths away from the plants until they start blooming. Once you take that off, make sure you wrap the lower part of the main stem of each plant with aluminum foil to prevent the moths from laying eggs on the stem. If you see wilting leaves or vines, try cutting out the borer and then cover the wound either with soil or tape to help it heal. Regarding the aluminum foil, you should just need strips that are maybe like an inch and a half in diameter by four inches. You're just wrapping that low part of the stem before it branches out and check on it every so often to see if you need to re wrap it or if you need to replace it with a little bit larger piece of aluminum foil. I have heard that this really works. Martha says, I live in North Carolina with very humid summers. How can I keep my pumpkins from rotting on the vine? I've seen the suggestion of putting cardboard under them. I'm probably not the best person to ask because we have very little humidity here, but you really have my sympathies. I would place a mulch of some sort under the pumpkins to make sure they're not sitting in a puddle of water or on damp soil. And certainly cardboard is an option or you could rest them on boards, something along those lines. But I, I think you're on the right track that that's a good idea to do it that way. Peg says, I have problems growing cucumbers. They never produce many, and why is that? Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, my question is, are they getting enough sunlight? They need at least six hours of full sun per day. Are you seeing pollinator activity around them? And another question I have, which ties into some of the previous questions, is, are you giving them a nitrogen fertilizer? Again, that promotes leafy green growth at the expense of blooming and setting fruit. So if you are giving them nitrogen fertilizer, I would definitely stop that and perhaps give them a little bit of fertilizer. Again, I suggest organic and make sure the middle number is the highest number, that's phosphorus. Sarah has a question about cross-pollination. She says, what's up with odd colored squash? The occasional spaghetti squash wearing a zucchini colored coat. <laughs> From what I understand, cross-pollination is only second generation, so why do we get those odd squash when using new packets of seed? Very interesting, Sarah. So members of the cucurbit family are notorious for cross-pollinating. But this should only happen when you save seeds from plants you grew in past years. If that's not the case, you should notify the seed supplier to let them know what happened. You should be able to rely on the squash being exactly what you bought. And I recall this happened to me with a small type of a winter squash a few years ago and it did some very strange things and pretty much produced inedible squash. So I contacted the seed supplier. She was awesome about it. She was very apologetic, mentioned that she had gotten a couple of notes from other folks as well. She was contacting her seed supplier and she was going to replace the seeds for me. So you definitely need to contact whoever the supplier is to let them know about your experience. I received three questions about powdery mildew on squash plants, and so I wanted to address those next. Karina says, 
powdery mildew caused by all the rain we've been getting here in Spokane. My zucchinis are beginning to show signs of powdery mildew and haven't grown as much anymore. Sonia says it has been a rainy spring here in northwest Montana and so far my pumpkins are hanging in there but I wonder if there is anything that could be applied to prevent powdery mildew. And Nicole asks, I seem to struggle with powdery mildew at some point each season here in Spokane. How can I prevent, treat, and stop its spread? It is very normal for squash plants to develop powdery mildew late in the season. Hot weather typically seems to bring it on here. It won't affect their production at that point. It's more of an aesthetic issue, so for me, I just leave it alone knowing we're getting towards the end of the season. That might not be what you wanted to hear, but it's certainly easier than trying to come up with some type of a method that prevents it. However, one thing I wanted to mention is that the fungus that causes powdery mildew does overwinter in the soil, so I would recommend practicing crop rotation where you don't plant members of the same plant family in the same place every year, if that's an option. I realize in small gardens that makes it challenging, but I use a three-year rotation in my garden and it really helps. Now I wanted to address Karina's question separately because I wanted to show her something. There are some squash leaves that naturally have silver pigments in them, so that might be what you're seeing. What you're looking at here is the leaf of one of my Claremore zucchini plants, and you'll notice there's kind of a silvery white marking on them, but it's definitely not powdery mildew. So what I would do is just let your plants grow, see how they do this year, and plant them in a different area of your garden next year if you can. Jeannie had a question about shade tolerant vegetable crops. She says, I have very little full sun in my yard. Which veggies will give me the most yield considering all the shade I get? I'm in zone six. Okay, Jeannie, so here are some suggestions of veggies that are more tolerant of less sun. And I'm not sure how much sunlight you get, so it's going to have to be an experiment for you but here is what I've got. Beets, bok choy, broccoli, cabbage, carrots, celery, chard, Chinese cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, leeks, lettuce, mizuna, mustard, pak choy, scallions, so green onions, spinach, and turnips. Have you got all that? <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's definitely going to be experimental for you to see how things do, but it's certainly worth a try. There's a couple other things you might consider doing. One would be to grow some vining types of plants vertically to where maybe they'll get up to where there's more sunlight. The other thought is if you planted them near a light colored wall or the side of a building that's painted white, let's say, that will reflect more light onto the plants. So these are just some ideas and I hope things grow well for you. I received a few questions about growing cabbage family crops. So you are looking at a bed that I have kohlrabi and rutabagas growing in. And also on the right, just so you don't freak out, that is a coyote decoy. That is Wiley. <laughs> and he wanted to be in the frame today, so there he is. So Lynn asks, why won't my kohlrabi bulb out? I had a successful crop in 2018, but it didn't bulb out in 2019 or 2020 so far. Is it the weather or should I be more patient? I winter sowed them this year. That's a tough question, Lynn. If they are planted too closely together or your temperatures have been out of the ordinary, meaning too hot or too cold, or if they're not getting enough water or enough nutrients in the soil, then those are all reasons that they didn't bulb out. 
So I'm hoping that you'll have better luck this year, although we've certainly had some pretty strange weather. But as you can see, my kohlrabi, and, which is in the middle of that bed, and the rutabagas are loving the wet weather, so they should be okay. But I would definitely look at the amount of water they're getting, or if you don't have enough nutrients in the soil, you might need to give them a little bit of food. Thulasi asks, I am in zone 5B in Markham, Ontario, Canada. I like to plant radishes once more for the season. Is this a good time to seed? Thank you. I'm thinking this should be a perfect time to plant them. They do prefer cooler weather in spring or early fall. So depending upon what your summers are like, you might be dictated by that. But they mature very quickly. So I should think you'd be able to get another crop from them and then maybe wait until near the end of the summer to plant your next crop. Jennifer has a question about growing broccoli. And so here is my broccoli bed as a backdrop. And in the foreground, there's little turnips growing as well. She says, how do I know when the broccoli is ready to harvest? Jennifer, what you want to look for is when the head of broccoli has fully formed, just like what you would expect for that variety, and the little florets are tightly closed. Just slice off the main head directly below it, and what will happen is smaller secondary heads will form along the sides, and then you can harvest those. So you really get at least two harvests from a single plant. The next couple of questions are about growing garlic, and this is my garlic bed as a backdrop. So Kathy would like to know about garlic scapes. When should we get them, how to harvest, and how to cook? We are in Zone 3, Wisconsin. Love the videos, she says. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kathy. I'm glad you're enjoying the videos so far. Hopefully this one is good. So for those who don't know, these curly cues here on garlic plants are called scapes. They only form on hard neck garlic, not on soft neck. So if you're growing soft neck and you're wondering why you don't have any scapes, that's why. So the thing is that this wants to form a flower head. While it's a nice curly cue, that's when you want to harvest them. And we're going to cut ours off today. And the way you harvest them is to cut them down right above the top leaf. And what you can do is saute them. You can chop them up. You can make garlic scape pesto. Just look up garlic scape recipes on the web and you'll be amazed at what's out there. The important thing is that you definitely want to remove these before these start heading upward. And that's because since it wants to form of a flower head, it will do so at the expense of the bulb. If you want good sized garlic bulbs, you definitely want to harvest your scapes. Now Corey was wondering a similar thing about onions, garlic, and leeks. So you now know about garlic. So let's talk about onions and leeks. This is one of our onion beds. And I'm just looking through here to see if I see any little flower buds. And I don't. If I did, I would nip them off immediately. Because again, if these are allowed to flower, it's at the expense of the bulb. And we want nice large onions. So that's why we nip them off right away. I can't recall if I've ever seen any of my leeks form a flower head, but if they did, I would definitely nip them off. Corey, you had a question as well about why leeks go woody. And I haven't had that happen, so I did a little research, and the number one reason is if you let them go to flower. 
So again, if you see any flower heads, nip them off right away. I have a few questions about fertilizers, and so I wanted to read you the questions and then I'll answer them. So Leanna says, which natural fertilizers do you use? How much and how often? Also, why is my lettuce bitter? She says, from reading, I think it needs fertilizer. Ethel wants to know, what is your favorite fertilizer for veggies? And Dulce says, do you feed your plants mid-season? If you do, what do you feed with and when? And she's in zone five. So let's tackle the lettuce issue first. That usually means the weather has been warm and just too hot for them. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, there are cool season crops, there's warm season crops, and the cool season crops typically do well either in early spring or near the end of the summer growing into fall because they really bolt to seed in the summertime when it gets hot. Fertilizer isn't going to resolve the problem at this point. But the main reason that lettuce gets bitter is because of the warm weather. But the bitterness could also be caused by not watering the plants enough or if your soil is low on nitrogen because that would stress the plants since they need it to develop leafy growth. So those are a couple of ideas. Now about fertilizer, you may or may not like this answer, but <laughs> My feeling is that if your soil is healthy, you shouldn't need to use fertilizers or at least use them very little. I only use organic amendments such as compost or bone meal. And there are some organic fertilizers that I really like. But it's very important not to overdo on the fertilizers because they will impact how the plants grow. For example, too much nitrogen causes leafy growth, but if you're growing something that needs to bloom and set fruit, that's not a good thing. No matter what you decide to use, follow the directions on the label and remember more is not better. For some reason, we all think that, you know, ooh, if a half a cup is good, then a whole cup must be even better. <laughs> no, just use what they recommend on the label. But for me personally, in the spring when I have young seedlings, I tend to give them either like a fish fertilizer or some type of a fertilizer that gets them off to a good start and gives them a little boost with nitrogen. Sometimes with some of the plants that I'm growing that have a root system like a carrot or a parsnip or a beet, I might add a little bone meal into the soil as I'm preparing the bed to plant, but that really is it. I do use compost early in the spring and in the fall after the garden is done, and our soil is very fertile. If you see a lot of earthworms in your soil, that's a very good sign of a healthy, fertile soil. So I really encourage you to look at how your plants are growing. If they're growing fine, don't worry about fertilizer. I know a lot of our plants look awful this time of year because it's been so chilly and so rainy, but they will perk up now that we're getting some lovely sunshine. And so I do think that we gardeners tend to overuse fertilizers quite a bit. If your plants are doing okay, just let them grow. Okay, I have a few more miscellaneous questions to answer. And since nobody asked about corn, I'm just going to sit next to the corn patch. <laughs> Jody says, my small raised bed has multiple veggies. How can I keep my kale from getting chewed up? I cannot do a row cover over the whole bed. Do I make an individual cover? Yeah, that's kind of challenging, Jody, but it's, it's not insurmountable. I'm not sure if you're having problems with aphids or cabbage worms, and I do use floating row cover to keep both of them away from the crops. If you can do an individual row cover over the kale crops, that would be great. 
Otherwise, what you can do is hose off aphids and either hand pick cabbage worms or use a BT spray, that stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, if you have the worms on the plants. But that's pretty much all you can do. And I, I know it's challenging when you mix veggies up. I've done that occasionally and then kind of kicked myself for mixing them together and making it challenging to protect the plants that are susceptible to insects. Now Erin has a question about critters. Any suggestions for keeping away critters such as rabbits, ground squirrels, and rats? She's tried bait, sprayed with repellents, mint, marigolds, cayenne, and so on. Now since those things haven't worked for you, what I really think is your best bet is to set up some kind of a barrier such as chicken wire, hardware cloth, netting, or something along those lines. I know how frustrating it is because we get all kinds of critter problems here, but if they're a regular problem for you and if everything else you've tried doesn't work, really a barrier is your best bet. And if you have a dog out in the yard, a lot of times that will help keep the critters away too. Lois says, I'm trying okra for the first time. I planted it from seed, transplanted it to a pot. I feed my okra every other week, but it has stopped growing. What tips do you have to ignite growth on a vegetable build as easy to grow? <laughs> she says, loves heat, question mark. I'm in zone 9A. Okay, well, first of all, being a Northwestern gardener, I am not an okra expert. <laughs> But you should not need to feed your plants so much. And I mentioned that earlier, so I don't want to beat a dead horse here. But um, if you're providing them with plenty of water and the weather has been warm, they should start growing. They do best in soil that is 80 degrees, and that is pretty warm. So if your weather has been cool, that might be the problem. I would just let them grow and hopefully they'll perk up soon. I received a couple of bug questions, and so I was going to address those now. Kate says, so many aphids. How do I get rid of them without ruining my veggie plants? I also bought 1,500 ladybugs. They hung around for a day, then deserted me. Oh boy. Well, first of all, aphids are such an annoying problem. There's so many of them. They're basically born pregnant, and ugh, they're just awful. I guess the question for me is which types of veggie plants are they on? As I mentioned, they really love cabbage family crops and the answer to that is to use floating row cover for the whole season. It acts as a physical barrier to keep the aphids out and also cabbage worms, by the way. Regarding the ladybugs, I don't recommend buying them because the ones that are harvested will compete with your native ladybugs and potentially expose them to disease. So it's really important not to buy them. I know garden centers sell them and I wish they would stop doing that. And the other thing is ladybugs don't know anything about property lines. They'll just go where the food is. So I would really like to take this opportunity to discourage people from buying ladybugs because it's just a waste of money and it can impact your native ladybugs and that's the last thing you want to do. Susie asked, what is your DIY spray for aphids? And to be honest, I don't make a DIY spray because I only get them on my cabbage family crops, so things like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, kohlrabi, and so on. And since none of them needs to be pollinated during the season, I just cover them with floating row cover for the entire season. It's a physical barrier to keep those insects away, but it still lets light and moisture come through it. Okay, the last question, finally. Eileen wants to know, how do you harvest cilantro, parsley, and lettuce so that it keeps growing all summer? Okay, we've made it to the final question. Eileen wants to know, how do you harvest cilantro, parsley, and lettuce so that it keeps growing all summer long? 
I don't do anything special about the parsley. It's a biennial, which means it will grow for two years. But the second year it goes to seed and there really isn't anything you can do to make it last longer than two years. But you could certainly pinch out the flower stalk that second year to keep it going a bit longer. But then it's going to be done. Lettuce is a cool season crop that does not tolerate hot weather. So you can grow it in the spring to early summer and then in late summer into fall. But that's it. For cilantro, I find that it bolts to seed really easily. There are some heat tolerant varieties that you can try, so be sure to do a web search on that for next year. If you mostly want cilantro for when you harvest your tomatoes so that you can make things like salsa, what I recommend you do is plant the cilantro seeds directly in your garden about 50 days before you expect to be picking tomatoes and it'll be nice and leafy at that time. Okay, we made it to the end of the questions. I hope this was interesting and informative for you. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions. I hope the answers were helpful for you. Thanks so much for watching everybody. I'll see you next week. Happy gardening.